I'd like to uh, first introduce Kathy Taylor, a poet who comes from Upton. Uh, she was born in Bedford, Massachusetts, and as a child loved to play uh, in her neighborhood with uh, the kids, kick the can, play at the woods, uh, put on plays. And she went on to work as a graphic artist, and she still practices that art and works as a middle school teacher, has raised two daughters. Only seven years ago, she started writing poetry after attending an open mic in Northbridge. And Kathy said, it was a time where finding and developing my voice was essential. Writing and speaking poems helped me to get to another place in my life. It was the same life, but I felt different about it. I can't say enough about the transformative power of poetry, the aha of knowing something in a different way. Her poetry has been published in a number of journals, as well as her artwork. And I would like to ask you to please help me join in a warm welcome for Kathy Taylor. So good to be here. I've been on the open mic for about two years now, and um, I'm delighted to read more poems this morning. It's about the year anniversary of um, Haiti's earthquake, and I have two um, poems. They're like double poems, um, considering that time. And the first one is based on a New Yorker cover that came out right after the earthquake. It's something called The Resurrection of the Dead, and it was, uh, it's a piece of artwork by France Zephyrin. <clears throat> An imbolc is a, um, between the winter solstice and the spring equinox, the exact halfway point is a time called imbolc. People in Europe celebrate that day, um, pay tribute to Bridget. So this is an imbolc poem um, honoring Bridget. Bridget, keeper of the iron forge and protector of our wells, imbolc is your day. Imbolc is the time of new beginnings. Sap begins to run, lambs are born. Imbolc is a place of life and fire in your belly. And we usually dress, greet you dressed in white with many glimmering candles reflecting on our mantle of snow. This is the time when we acknowledge the inner quickening of Mother Nature, led by the increase in sunshine every day. But Bridget, this winter for Imbolc, we need to meet you in Haiti, this place near the equator of green jungle and bright hot sun. Here in Haiti, we find you as Mon Mon Brigette, she is the one who always guards and protects the graveyards. The dead stay with us for a year and a day after passing, and only then can the spirit be released and the connection to earth dissolved. Haiti is a place in great shock. The earth opened up and shook and shook, and a tremendous earthquake brought unheard of destruction to the island. We are with you in spirit and prayers honoring the mass grave of over 200,000 of the dead. We will be with you praying for the dead for a year and a day. We are here to help with the transition of the 200,000 souls into the other side. Two, this is a time of great power. Think of this power as a coin with two sides. One side with great financial wealth, while on the other side, great spiritual wealth. The side with the great financial wealth has the least spiritual wealth, and the side with the greatest spiritual wealth has the weakest financial wealth. May the spiritual wealth of Vudan, taking care of community, living naturally with the plants and animals of the island, may the spiritual wealth of Haiti find its way to the Americans, while the many, many coins of Americans find their way to the hungry mouths of the Haitians. And this is the true meaning of the balance of power, gratitude, and aid. Last winter, I was reading this book called The Serpent in the Rainbow by Wade Davis. And this next poem, it's going to be in two parts, um, was also influenced by a, um, like a rainbow goddess. Her name's Aida Wido, goddess of the rainbow. And this particular um, art piece is by Hirana Janto. It was published in Llewellyn's 2001 Goddess Calendar. <clears throat> and this poem is called Aida Wido, Serpent in the Rainbow, one. Every year we trek out of Port-au-Prince and we go to the rugged mountains. The few become hundreds, then thousands, and then over 10,000. 10,000 people pilgrimage to the place of the river, place with the great tree, place where the river forks into two branches and then comes crashing down. Three 100-foot waterfalls. Thunderous falls to the pools below. 
and we jump right in and we cleanse ourselves. We wash off the dirt and grit of the city and the long track. We splash and swim and we bottle the water for future help. This year we are especially grateful to be here. A devastating earthquake of incredible power and fury brought unprecedented loss of life, loss of community, loss of homes. So many have died, so much has gone. We dive deep into the water knowing of its cleansing power and listen to the roar of the falling water. And then the sun peeks out from behind a cloud. <gasps> I eat a widow. I eat a widow. We hear the many cries. She's here. The rainbow, the rainbow over the falls. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, violet. She's here. Be present with her colors, reuniting us with our fire and our passion for living. I eat a widow. <clears throat> Part two. I eat a widow too. It was a dreadful day. One situation after the other came crashing down with upset kids, lines to see the school psychologist, internet wildness in the nights between the school days, wrong medications and angry children dissolving into tears. <clears throat> it was a very long day. And I make my way home, I pick up the mail, I get out of the car, I go up the stairs to the porch and unlock the door and swing it wide open. And in the corner of my eye, I see Aida Wido greeting me right here with me in my house. At the corner of my entrance, strong prism light with delightful fern shadow, a jungle-like appearance, welcoming me with rainbow colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, violet. And I laugh and I shake off the day and I grab my camera to catch the moment. In my rainbow retreat, I am at peace. I eat a widow. I have that photo, but I'm having trouble with my computer right now and was not able to um, bring it here. Um, this next poem, I'm working on a, a collection of poems, and I'm calling it tentatively Cowboys and Indians. It's about this time period of the 1500s and the 1600s, such an exciting time of Europeans and Native Americans interchanging. Um, and reinventing ourselves. And this poem was, will probably fit into that collection. It's called Our Lady of Guadalupe. Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared during a time of great change. The Spaniards and the Mayans face to face. Besides all the gold, chocolate tomatoes and corn were exchanged for horses and eggs and metal, armor and cooking pots. The Mayan and Spaniards face to face, two worlds colliding, when Our Lady of Guadalupe made her entrance. With one foot on the moon, her aura bright with color, a rounded belly and a black ribbon close about her neck. She appeared as a miracle and has been prayed to ever since. She is watching over the Americas, always pregnant with possibility. This next poem, I have a piece of artwork. This is an original piece by myself. I, um, this is for my two daughters. I have two girls. They're, they're big, um, 30 and 20. And um, I had a wonderful natural birth with my older one. I had a midwife who was a neighbor and a close friend who lived around the corner. And um, I just found the time of birth just to be a really powerful time. And I created that piece for both of my girls just to um, um, really remember the empowering um, sense of birth. And I later wrote this poem, sometimes this happens, the words and the art goes back and forth, and it's called The Body and Blood of Our Mother. We all start by borrowing the body and blood of our mothers. And she opens up a space in her heart to let us grow within her. And as we grow and wiggle and squirm and roll over, we are part of her body, protected by her skin and fed through her blood. And our cells multiply and divide and form tissues and organs and organ systems and finally a whole live person who then needs to push out of the womb through the birth canal, the doorway of the cervix, and on out to the greater world ahead. We start with the body and blood of our mother and we are birthed between her two strong legs. She opens up wide enough for our large heads to push through and out, leaving her forever marked by our passage. And we open up our lungs and yell and we leave that watery world of the womb behind. We start with the body and blood of our mother, and for this we give thanks. 
This next poem has no art. Um, <clears throat> it's called Spider Woman. I will say, you know, Cheryl asked me, uh, my name is Kathy Taylor, my maiden name was Kathy Weaver. And um, as, a, as a weaver, and we had eight kids, we used to collect a lot of poems about um, cloth and weaving and, um, and, and um, Spider Woman being the eight, I think we really resonated with her. And my kids, when they were little, I would, at the crazy days of winter, just cabin fever, sometimes I'd give them a ball of yarn and they could decorate their rooms like a spider web. It used to entertain them. So this is um, a poem called Spider Woman. I think I'm just going to turn this over because I'm visualizing your head. Spider Woman is a force, the magnetic source of the entire world. Spinning, twirling, mighty thread to create the double illusion of time and space. The two distinct threads running through our heads. It is said that Spider Woman, when invited, will sit in your ear and guide you through the dark times. She knows the labyrinth well. She knows that the twists and turns, seemingly without rhyme or reason, gives life its true meaning. And we're told that in days of old, Spider Woman leaned down and helped out, weaving reeds into baskets, string into nets, and thread into fabric. Most importantly, she helped with weaving stories into the fabric of life. And the stories were the matrix each culture lived by. But then, we put Spider Woman aside. Nobody spoke of her anymore. In the industrial age, the modern era, silly stories about a spider had to go. Put aside into the back of an old closet, Spider Woman sat and sat, and waited, and then waited some more, and then slowly began to weave a new web. And she emerged in splendid shape, stronger and totally transformed, and her web appears right in time for today's information age. Quietly, she's been weaving the source of the information links for this time. Weaving the storytelling World Wide Web, known today as the Internet. Spider Woman has gone electric. <laughs> she's plugged in. Click. With a touch of the mouse, one transcends space, and communication goes on worldwide all at the same time. And Spider Woman smiles knowingly. The stories told within this web are finally reuniting the entire globe. The world connects through the internet, making Spider Woman a vital force once again. Honor the spider, honor the web, interconnections the vital thread. Honor the ties that bind us to Earth. Pass on the story of Spider Woman's rebirth. So I have been doing artwork for a much longer time. I'm a collage artist. I work with scissors, um, you know, and cut things out. And this next poem is called Cutouts. And I did bring a piece of artwork. I have a million cutouts, but I thought this one uh, fit the poem. Many scissors, tape, and glue sticks line the cluttered table, and papers of many colors and sizes await. To warm up, I cut a few wiggling snakes. Then a few circles become inner spirals, the inward journey creating inner, p inner peace, and the scissors journey within. Then stars, a focal point jutting out with many sharp edges, concentrating to keep points sharp and keep inner focus of the middle. Moons are cut from circles too, besides spirals the most fun, slicing the edges of circles, keeping sharp narrow ends and full middles. Then my hands hold the scissors, expectant and curious, to see what will emerge next. What boundary will be explored, feeling its edge as the two blades cross, as emerging lines define foreground and background, background dropping away a scrap as the shape appears. The scissors' sharp edge cuts into a new piece of paper, beginning a new space and shape. Becoming my big toe, I cut it. And then I feel my arch curve in, and feel around the heel and in at the ankle, and then up to more rounded calf. As my scissors cut the outer boundary of my leg, the extra space drops away and the outer shell of leg emerges. I continue on cutting sturdy thigh and widened hip, and in at the waist, curving again for rounded breast, up to the armpit, and out to outstretched arm and fingers, reaching out, each digit reaching out. My scissors cut back down the arm and around to the curving neck and out to define chin and ear and wispy hair. If the paper is folded in two, then I am done. 
I open up the paper to see mirrored sides becoming full woman, each arm and leg doubled, the symmetry of body clear. The woman struts out of the paper, her outer edge holding inward shape, sometimes coming out with attitude, other times cut as meek and mild, reverence, awe, wonder, all expressed with cut out shapes, each woman cut becoming an entity in and of herself. Cutouts become a series of women of the night, white bodies against black starry skies with moon in different phases. Young, old, and middle-aged, often symmetrical but sometimes not, but together become a parade of cutout women, a series of edges reveling in inner strength cut out from darkness. Yep, thank you. You know, I just pulled this poem out today. It's my, um, I, I know I've read it here before at open mic, but it's my other, um, sometimes the in-bulk um, holiday is called Groundhog's Day, and this is my um, ode to the groundhog shadow. I'll finish up with this um, poem here. It just, it really, it fits the uh, energy we have now. Okay, groundhog shadow. At the end of summer and into fall, the groundhog eats and eats, becoming plump and round, and finally descends into the ground, entering a tunnel to a waiting space, closing eyes, finds the place. Breath becomes slower and slower yet again. Heartbeat matches the pace, allowing body to become a suspension of time. With all systems on hold, breath is making sacred space. While the cold and snow and sleet and icy rain pelt the scenery above, the groundhog remains serenely poised and is dreaming for us all. Joined by his four-legged cousins, bear and squirrel, they all join the dream time state. All are in suspended animation. All are holding the spirit time alive while the winter above rages on. At the time of midwinter, we remember the sleeping groundhog and ask for a reckoning. The groundhog in full fling of winter's dreaming rouses slowly, so slowly to our calling, and keeping the mantle of the dream state close around him, returns for a peek at the landscape above. Groundhog peruses the air with nose first, longing for a whiff of mud, longing for the aroma of a fresh breeze, but instead smells the crisp air emanating from intricate ice crystals making up our present winter scene. Groundhog squints sleepy eyes for a tiny sliver of view and brings all the colors from the dream state into the stark landscape, bringing the dream through and infusing the land with a heightened reality only a dream can bring. Music from the deep resounds across the scene, magnetic rainbow aurora borealis now revealed, and sweeping colors paint the winter sky and are reflected across the snowy land below. The sun pulsing strong, becoming stronger, casts long shadows, and the day becomes transformed once more. Groundhog, gazing into shadow, now remembers place of deep and turns and returns to the dark below, leaving the daytime state to linger across that landscape to remind everyone of the true reality of the altered days of winter. Thank you, hibernating nations, and to Groundhog for this day, for the integration and power of the dream. And I'll just leave you with my, um, this was Cheryl sent around in the email, the sun moves like a metronome. Back and forth, rising and setting, faster in winter, slower in summer, up and down, back and forth, light and dark, waking, sleeping, sun up and sun down, dawn and dusk, reliable. Solar heartbeat keeps the pace in our place here on earth. Thank you. to be reading um, two poems and I appreciate you listening. The first one is called Leaving the Forest. In my father's house the rooms were dark and ugly. I began soft as clay. When I left at 15 I had hardened like a stone. I slowly learned predators are drawn to the light. I ceased to bathe, clothes stiff with dirt, fingernails black crescents. Tears burned like holy water. It was sacred initiation. 
a ride of endurance. A grotesque forest grows, dense gnarled bristle, where the house stood, a burnt offering, deal with the devil. I bury my filthy clothes deep in the ashes, cover them with roots and leaves. Light casts long shadows through the trees. Wasn't it spring? Wasn't it spring, tender buds about to break, bluebells in the meadow, paths of rivers widening, when we slept without touching. Weren't the seeds planted? Wasn't the ground moist, sky filled with birdsong, wind carefree, when the invisible scars began to form? Stars mapped a dark foreboding. What we fear becomes inevitable, disgrace in expectation. There are stones in the garden that cannot be removed. A rift, broken lines, a strange calm in words like deceit and disbelief. When the soul dies, does a body mourn? This is how the world ends. As the ground begins to thaw, as root becomes the blossom, as the rain ceases. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a gardener, and I love bees. To the bees, again, I heard you flew away yesterday. The words whispered with perplexity, a postal clerk in the business of delivering news, a photographer in the business of transmitting image. Both keep beekeepers, they, sprinkled like flowers along my daily rounds, their subtle fragrances calling me, their stories unbound, a newskeeper, a photo keeper, unexpected beacons found, and I carry their message to my friend. While embracing our thoughts about the bees, her wild spirit mother, Gloria, speaks. Guess what? She unclasped her gentle hand and tucked inside, like a prayer upon a heart, a perfect bee, too silent, urges, notice me. This is a, um, a skeleton poem. Christmas tree, my sister, you glowed and fell like a bird that never falls. The ground desired your face upon it like a bird that never falls. Truths are untruths. Gravity of a complex nature demanded you down, down, down. Your lights came crashing down with you, your branches disheveled. Your glittering presence left its heights and toppled. Down, 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 a vision destroyed, cut off, banished to below. Oh, Christmas tree, you fell, first in natural form, second in decorated self. Essence and presence came crashing down, the vision ruined. You were not protected, O oh bird that never falls. The ground sought your, your face, the ground sought you close upon it. Labor lost and wasted, now you lay low. O oh, Christmas tree, my sister, there is silence ringing as you lay there, beauty to the ground, shimmering in an inappropriate place. You lay there, the silence ringing around you. It is truly over. Christmas is over. O oh, Christmas tree, are you now imperfect? Are you not now ugly, disgrace from your descent, grace upon the ground? For a long swoon, for a long moment, it is truly over. Christmas is over. O oh, bird that never falls, wings upon the earth, it is over. But wait, as the silence is ringing around you, you rise. Oh, my Christmas tree, my sister, you rise. The silence ringing around you, and as you rise, an unknown question is created. You rise from below where your branches scraped. You rise from below where your tinsel sprinkled upon baseness. Baseness? You rise in a humorous moment, kissed by the air. Oh, wings, you rise. Oh, Christmas tree. Oh, my sister, you rise. You rise, 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 silence ringing. You rise and you stand. Now imperfect, you are at last perfect. More breathtaking, more extraordinary, more glittering, resurrected, queen, uniting the above and the below, sanctifying and sanctified by the abyss, holy tree. Peach 
I'm Dr. Kathy Phillips. And I'm Dr. Andrew Blum. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease and stroke. It affects more than 3 million people, with 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year. The condition is caused by a temporary disturbance in brain function, resulting in various kinds of seizures. These seizures can produce involuntary movements, changes in awareness, altered behavior, or loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a major chronic medical condition and can affect a person's quality of life similar to arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. It can limit activity and cause pain, anxiety, or depression. It can also be life-threatening. Because epilepsy can also present non-medical challenges such as discrimination and social stigma, we urge you to learn more about this condition. To find out more about this disorder, including its symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment, visit epilepsyfoundation.org.